All right, we're going to now jump into rotational kinematics and rotational motion. So everything's moving in a, in a circle and spinning around. And one of the big questions you have to ask is, why do we need this? Well, the reason why, notice this circle with the three dots along the radius here. Each dot is moving at a different tangential velocity. The dot on the outside has to move much, much faster because it has to move through a further, if you will, displacement s. Um, circumference of circle 2 pi r, so it has a further radius going outward, so it has a further distance to go through compared to the inside dot that isn't moving very fast at all. But still, it's one circle. And so we need to relate all those points along that radius together. So we deal with angles. Notice all three points are going through the exact same angle at the exact same time. So if you thought about angular velocity, how quickly you pass through an angle, they're all moving at the same rate. Now, equations that you already know. Circumference is 2 pi times the radius. An arc length uh, that we're dealing with, s, or displacement s, around. Uh, theta, the angle you pass through, equals the displacement you're going around the outside of the circle, divided by the radius. Something else you need to remember. A revolution going all the way around has 2 pi radians in it. There are 2 pi radians in an entire circle. So one revolution, anytime you need to convert from revolutions to radians to make units match up, or maybe you're being asked for angular acceleration that is oftentimes in radians per second squared, uh, 2 pi radians. Now all the equations that you have are the same as the linear equations. Just translate it into angular, if you will. We already know this equation here just from standard math. Uh, the angle that you pass through is the displacement divided by the radius, and solving that around to get it to where they relate between the two is a good idea. Uh, your, your velocity, uh, just like this velocity over here, displacement divided by time, velocity is going to be change in angle divided by time, or the time derivative of a angle equation, which then you know should lead your mind to thinking about motion graphs, should lead your mind to thinking about taking the derivative of an angle uh, or of an equation in terms of theta to get an angular velocity. Angular acceleration is going to be uh, the change in angular velocity divided by the time it takes to speed up, slow down, right? Or the time derivative of an angular velocity equation, or the second derivative, if you will, of a uh, uh, of an equation based upon the angle theta. Um, so dw dt uh, knows the vector symbol above it. I should mention units here. It's the exact same uh, as what happens with your tangential. It's just no longer meters. It's radians, radians per second, and radians per second squared. Also of note is the relationship between them. Uh, and I'll go through this derivation in class, it's a very simple one, but uh, your angular velocity times the radius gets you back to the tangential velocity, how fast these points are moving tangentially or straight at that point. And uh, your angular acceleration times the radius gets you back to your tangential accelerations. The same thing up here, your uh, angle times your radius gets to your actual displacement s around the circle. Now your kinematic equations are actually all the same too. I mean, look at your standard kinematics and compare over here. Your velocity is replaced with angular velocity. Your initial velocity with angular uh, initial velocity. Uh, acceleration uh, with angular acceleration. Time, of course, is, is the same no matter what. If we're going in a circle or not, time is just time. There's no such thing as circular time. Uh, so all of those are the same as well. And so every last problem you've already done, where, where it's linear, going backwards and forwards, can also be done rotationally using all of these equations. And they're solved the same way. Create a variable bank. Uh, write down everything that you know, what you don't know, what you're looking for. Uh, draw a picture if need be. Pick an equation. Sometimes it'll just be a very simple plug-chug sort of thing. Um, sometimes you might need to take the derivative of a equation. If Let's say they give you an equation for the angle and they ask for the angular velocity at two seconds, so you need to take the derivative of it. Or sometimes it's going to require kinematic because it has multiple things missing, right? Or it has, it has multiple pieces that need to be combined uh, that uh, the basic equations just won't do for you. Um, so write, an, uh, write down everything you know, pick an equation, substitute in, and solve. Let's deal with directions for angular velocity and angular acceleration because it's a very odd idea. Now, you know vectors have to go in a straight line and cannot be turned, uh, cannot be curved. So with that in mind, uh, the initial reaction that I had whenever I was learning this back in the day was, hey, the uh, angular velocity should go along the curve because the thing is spinning, but that's not allowed for vectors. Uh, and velocity is a vector that can't be curved and it cannot change directions and it would change directions here, nor can it go off tangential 
horizontal because it would change directions or go along the radius. And, and I feel like the curve would make the most sense and then maybe tangential would make the second most sense, but neither of those is, is allowed because of the rules for vectors. In fact, the only spot that this could go is in the axis that it isn't spinning around. And so that's what we do. It actually comes from the cross product, the mathematical cross product. Never mind that for now. We'll, we'll come back to that. What I just need you to know is how to get the direction from a little trick, if you will. It's called the right hand rule. Take your fingers and point it in the direction and curl them in the direction that the wheel is spinning, kind of like you're seeing happening here. So curl your fingers in the direction the wheel is spinning and then poke out your thumb. The direction the thumb is pointing is the direction of the angular velocity. Angular acceleration works the exact same way. It's just you need to think about speeding up, slowing down. Curl your fingers uh, around the wheel uh, in the direction that it is speeding up or slowing down. So if it's speeding up, you would curl them the same way it's going and the thumb would point the same direction as the angular velocity. If it's slowing down, technically you're going to reverse your fingers. It's going to go the opposite way. So whenever you curl, you'll see your thumb is going to come out this way from the wheel along the axis that uh, it, it, is, it is spinning around, if you will. Which should make sense that angular velocity, uh, angular acceleration would be opposite of angular velocity if we were trying to decelerate it. I know this idea feels kind of weird. We're going to continue to talk about this in future videos, and we'll continue to discuss this idea of right-hand rule in class. All right, a couple of very straightforward questions. I have here a bicycle wheel that has been spun up uh, to 3.5 revolutions per second, uh, and we're going to try to slow it down to a rest in 4.5 seconds, and the question is what tangential acceleration uh, must it be given? So in other words, we're taking some brake pad, let's say, and, and putting it up against the bike wheel to try to slow it down, or maybe pressing the bike wheel down into the ground to try to slow it down. A uh, bike wheel has a radius of 25 centimeters, you can see here on the wheel, uh, and so the question is how much, uh, how much uh, time, excuse me, what tangential deceleration must we give it by pressing up into that? And then we're going to talk about uh, normal force and friction down here. All right, so uh, creating a variable bank here, I have my angular velocity to start out with in 3.5 revolutions per second. Uh, I see a little problem here. I'm in terms of revolutions, not radians, and I'm going to need to get to radians to be able to deal with my tangential acceleration, the cross between rotational and uh, tangential. I have a time, and I'm looking for tangential acceleration. Now in my head this seems like a very straightforward problem. I have a velocity, I have a time, I have an acceleration. Acceleration equals displacement over, or equals velocity, change of velocity over time. And we're trying to get this thing to slow down to rest, so I should also write in here omega naught is going to end up being zero, oh, excuse me, this is omega naught, and then omega is going to end up being zero here, because my initial velocity, 3.5, and I'm trying to slow it down to a final velocity, final angular velocity of zero, and so I have a, uh, I have a velocity of time, I'm looking for acceleration, but notice that half of them are rotational, half of them are angular, and, and so the only way I'm going to get tangential acceleration is using the equation tangential acceleration equals the radius times the angular acceleration. So that means I need to solve for the angular acceleration first. Now, so I'm using the angular acceleration equation, change in angular velocity divided by time uh, as the basic angular acceleration equation, just like the basic angular velocity, or ang uh, excuse me, just like the basic acceleration equation. So basic angular acceleration equation, just like the normal acceleration equation. Um, thing is, though, I need to change my 3.5 revolutions per second into radians. Remember how to get from revolutions to radians. In one revolution, there are two pi radians, so I just need to multiply by two pi. And I come out with an angular acceleration, negative 4.887 with other decimals. I'm not rounding for sig figs here yet. Radians per second squared. I did not talk uh, enough about the, uh, the, the units for all of these uh, angular rotational ideas. And they're the exact same thing as uh, your regular tangential. It's just, you know, per second squared for acceleration. It's just not meters in the numerator. It's radians. So change meters to radians for all your units whenever you're dealing with rotation. You'll be fine. Now I just substitute that in and solve. All right, now that I know the tangential acceleration, that what would be pointing back this way, if you will, from the wheel, uh, needed 1.2 meters per second with sig figs. Um, let's assume that all the wheel's mass is on its rim on the outside, which, by the way, is very, very important, because if some of that mass is distributed inside, you're not going to need the same amount of force. Thing, things completely change, then we need discussions of torque, and we're not there yet. So that is a very important assumption there. Um, and the coefficient of friction between the brake and the wheel, 0.95, how hard would you need to press, a.k.a. what is the normal force, right, how hard you're pressing the two things together, to stop the wheel in uh, 4.5 seconds.
So now notice, up top, I'm now in tangential acceleration. I have solved for what tangential acceleration I need to give this wheel to stop it in 4.5 seconds. I've already taken care of the 4.5 seconds by solving for the tangential acceleration. Now I need to find the force. So this is just an F equals ma. Now this is linear F equals ma, but I am also in linear acceleration now. If we were in rotational, we would need to deal with torque. More to come on that later. Now the only force acting would be the force of friction coming back this way, opposite the way the wheel uh, wants to go, if you will. Um, so I'm going to call that negative. Uh, also, I missed a negative up here with my acceleration, which is a complete mistake by me. Now notice down here in the uh, force equation, uh, since the only force is friction, force of friction is mu times normal force. I went ahead and broke that down. Force of friction uh, is the only force negative, mu times normal force negative coming back the other way here. I'm choosing negative this way and positive going that way uh, equals ma. Uh, so now I can actually go ahead and solve because I know a, I know uh, my m, uh, and I know my mu. I actually don't know my M, so I need to give you that. I meant to give you that in the problem. Mass of the wheel is around 2.5 kilograms, and that'll let me substitute in and solve for normal force. As you can see, sorry for not clearly writing 0.95 there, it actually doesn't take much force. 3.2 newtons, because you're not trying to stop a wheel overly fast, 4.5, and it's just a bicycle wheel. You've got a pretty rough surface, 0.95 coefficient of friction. Uh, and so this is kind of your experience. You can lightly tap something and generally stop a bike's bicycle wheel uh, with a very little amount of force, 3.2 newtons. Now I should emphasize once again, this only works if all the mass exists on the outside of the wheel. If it's distributed through, uh, through all the way uh, inwards, if it's a solid wheel, for example, the ball game completely changes. Uh, one last problem here. A Cessna is a common type of plane uh, used all over the place. Uh, its engine, or excuse me, its propeller generally runs around uh, 2400, uh, 2400 RPMs. And one of the reasons that it's used is how quickly it can start up. Now, this is a real time, this one I had to make up because uh, I couldn't find that statistic. But we're going to say that it starts up and it's all the way up to speed in just two seconds, which, which feels about right because that's kind of the point with a Cessna is it, it's how quickly it can start up so where you can actually uh, go. And so then I have two questions about the Cessna. Um, what angular acceleration does the engine give the propeller, so solve for alpha, um, and went, while it's bringing it up to speed, and how many revolutions does it go through um, in, in that time? So what's the, what's the final angle here, if you will? Now, notice here, we're dealing with revolutions in the end. So that means, since everything's given to me, notice revolutions here in my variable bank, I can actually leave these in terms of revolutions. Now, if you would like, you could convert here to, um, to radians, so multiply by 2 pi. We're going to have to get rid of this minute thing. Notice minute, second doesn't match up. Revolutions per minute and second. Always look at your units, make sure they match. So we're going to have to convert this back down to, to seconds here. Um, but uh, if, if I'm dealing with revolutions and I want my answer to come out in revolutions, that means this answer for theta would come out in revolutions, and my acceleration will come out in revolutions per second squared. I'm going to convert back down to seconds, and that's perfectly fine. Those aren't common units, but those are perfectly fine units to use. So that, that, that's what I'm going to do so I don't have to worry about converting. All right, so now I've converted back to revolutions per second for my, for my uh, final angular velocity here. Um, my initial angular velocity is zero because we're starting it up. How, how long does it take to actually get up to speed? Now I need to pick an equation, um, and my first thing is I'm solving for angular acceleration. So I know, my initial angu I know my initial angular velocity, I know my final angular velocity, I know how long it takes. I'm looking for acceleration. You can either choose the base acceleration equation or the one that's moved around. We call it a kinematic even though it's the base acceleration equation. So whenever I substitute that in, I come out with 20 revolutions per second for an uh, angular acceleration. Normally, this would have been radians per second if we had converted all of our revolutions into radians. But this problem, we're asking for revolutions in the end, so it works as long as our units all match up. We also had to solve for angular uh, acceleration first. If you look back at all the kinematics, all of them involve acceleration. So acceleration had to be the first thing I solved for. Now that I know my angular acceleration, I can solve for how many revolutions, or here, theta, um, how many revolutions we pass through. So looking back, now we can pick either of the two kinematics. So I'm, so I'm going to go ahead and pick one of the kinematics that uh, we didn't use, and now it's just substituting in and solving. 
so come out with 40 revolutions. All of these problems work exactly the same as the basic velocity acceleration and the kinematic equations that you did back at the beginning of the year. Just now we're dealing with it rotationally, so don't get freaked out. Create a variable bank, pick an equation that works, draw a picture possibly, um, pick an equation that works, substitute it into equation, and solve.